There are a few franchises whose name alone brings back memories like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. From its meteoric rise in the early to mid-2000s, all the way to its most recent remake of OnePlus 2, the THPS franchise grew into a monolith, spawning imitations, spin-offs, and even an entire Activision subdivision, at least for a time, and even catapulted the entire skateboarding profession into the spotlight. Saying the words, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, will have people reminisce about their childhood, scoring big combos, doing cool lines, and even playing against others in online play. Even mentioning the words Superman and Goldfinger together will elicit a response from the franchise's fans. Now, this video is not about its rise, fall, or resurrection. There are plenty of other videos and documentaries that better discuss this in full. However, even during the darkest days such as during the Ribomoto era, and the now dying flame of the post One Plus Two era, there remains a large group of gamers who continue to play the games and carry the torch into the future. I would be remiss to say that this is not a story about the entire Tony Hawk's Pro Skater scene. Between the Thug Pro, King of the Hill, THPSX, and Improv communities, each of them have their own story history that is best left for others to tell. Instead, this is about a story about one subset of gamers whose goal is entirely different from the rest. They wish to accomplish one thing, complete the game as fast as humanly possible. The pro skater community has been my home for nearly 10 years now. During my time, legends have come and gone, challengers have appeared to push the game to its absolute limits, and we have done countless events to help raise money for charity or various causes. With 2024 being the 25th anniversary of this storied series, I wanted to document this be written community and just show how far we have come. Every game has its own story to tell, rivalries that have long since been forgotten, and world records that have been forged by those who came before. I would like to take some time to start from the beginning. Just like how the very first Pro Skater game paved the way for the entire franchise, it also paved the way for what we would become. The beginnings of the scene date back quite a while. Almost 20 years, in fact. On July 1st, 2006, a user by the name of Nick McWin posted the very first known account of Pro Skater 1 speedrunning on the Speed Demos Archive forums. For those unaware, Speed Demos Archive, or simply SDA, is a website devoted to everything speedrunning, featuring a large forum for users to chat and share game knowledge, updates on the scene itself, confirmations of legitimate world records, or amazing runs sent to them, and much, much more. Unfortunately, and this will become a trend throughout this video, all of the videos that Nick posted are gone. He posted the videos on a file sharing site called putfile.com, which was shut down in... Let's just say I'm a few years late. Nick did post that the now deleted video achieved a 10 minute, 32 second time in the 100% category if you disregard the skater board and level selections. And that is disregarding the fact that this was conducted on emulator, which is usually disallowed by SDA themselves. While obviously this is more of a segmented time, the overall time is a good benchmark to go off of. The thread would continue with other users giving support to Nick. Several posters chimed in and gave assistance or advice as needed, before Nick ultimately announced he would not be able to record and send a quality video to SDA, citing his age and inability to earn the money to get the equipment necessary. Nevertheless, not long after, a new player would appear to help push the game further. The Amazing Jordo. Within the month, Jordo would continually speak with Nick on new ideas and strategies for the game. The runs are lost to time, but he was able to make respectable progress in multiple levels. In a complete surprise, I was able to contact Jordo and ask him some questions. In our little Q&A, he would say he'd look for consistency of speed for the first runs he completed and was looking to improve it even more as time went along. He would go on to say that he comes back and checks on the scene every so often, and still somewhat sees his original lines somewhere in there. 
In the end, he was not able to get a good setup in time before he burnt out from trying to get the perfect run for others to watch. Returning to the forum post, this was the first instance of current speedrunning tech being mentioned in any sort of capacity. For example, backflip spin over the transfer, kickflip slash heel flip to not waste time and have the score add up. For the first point, the N64 version of the game, the platformer choice for both Nick and Jordo, is objectively the fastest version due to its load times. But there is one quirk with the N64 that is not present in any other version. In all other versions, doing a backflip restricted you from spinning, but doing a backflip on the N64 controller, then using the control stick to spin allowed you to spin the trick and acquire much larger combos more quickly. While there are faster options in the current day, this is still a great choice for beginner and intermediate players. The other point mentioned, kickflip slash heel flip to not waste time, is still very important for real-time speedruns. Let's say you get a huge combo, then you go for end run. By doing so, and not doing any sort of extra tricks, the game would slowly count down to zero to give you your final score. This is obviously very slow. Instead, if you do a very quick trick that has very little points, you will skip this entire sequence. Ultimately, even with this new attention, Pro Skater 1 would fall back into silence for another year. Nick and Jordan may not have been the first players to submit a run to SDA, but they did pave the way forward for whomever would tackle the game later. Not too much later, two separate groups would begin to work on Pro Skater 1 in their own ways. On June 27, 2007, the first recorded speedrun of THPS1 was completed. While it took them almost a year to submit it to SDA, this combobulator would take the honor of being the very first player to submit a Tony Hawk speedrun that was approved on the website. If you look at the notes for the SDA run, you would see that a player known as Cyberath will be credited with another major discovery for the scene. In THPS1 and THPS2, if you click on retry on the pause menu, then hit end run afterwards, it will skip several animations that play to show you your accomplishments throughout that current heat or run. While it didn't really matter much for in-game time, which is what SDA used, it did matter for RTA speedruns later down the line. This combobulator ended up using Jeff Rowley, a skater that would later go on to be the definitive choice for speedrunners. Jeff's tricks allowed for better consistency while still having the overpowered backflip at his disposal. As a note, outside of one very specific use case that we will get into later, stats matter very little between the different skaters, especially compared to later entries in the series. Instead, the best skaters is usually determined by the arsenal of tricks at their disposal. Going into the run itself, Discombobulator put together a respectable speedrun, starting with the first level of Warehouse. The route consists of a counterclockwise rotation around the level, using the ramp after the taxi to get the extra points necessary for the point goals. It is a very quick, effective, straightforward, and fairly easy route, and it would serve as the basis for warehouse routes until the mid to late 2010s. For school, Discombobulator went to the right from spawn and made a jump onto an awkward overhang while getting some points with special tricks along the way. Jumping up to the secret tape, he would do a 360 nolly into a backflip to get the rest of the points needed for pro score. After landing a quick impossible to make the previous combo count all at once, he would finish the level. Now you might be asking yourself, what about the rest of the goals in this level? There's two more, right? Well, along with streets, school has some goals skipped. In this case, we are going to skip benches and collecting the rest of the skate letters because they take too long to collect. In previous SDA threads, the main concern about Maul was that it would take multiple runs or heats to complete all objectives. This combobulator would lay these concerns to rest with a well-played Maul that showcased, amongst everything else, a very clever setup to fast plant to the tape's overhang. Combined with some nifty trick selection, the level is completed with ease. Chicago would be the first competition level, and honestly it doesn't really require a whole lot to get bronze. While this level would see some refinement over the years, Discombobulator would take the first heat to do a 360 nolly into a backflip. Then on the second one, he would do a quick combo on the middle wall. Combined, he would have more than enough points to get the bronze medal and move on to downtown. Downtown is a very large level with plenty of objectives scattered throughout it. Immediately from spawn, he turns around and climbs the building to get up to the secret tape before jumping down and completing the rest of the objectives in the level. Now, we move on to Downhill Jam. This level is lovingly called Run Kill Jam by the community, and is definitely in the upper echelon of levels that have killed runs. No matter what game it is, runs will die here. Now, in THPS1, 
The biggest concern and run killer is the jump to the secret type. If you barely mess up this jump, there is no recovering and you will lose a minimum of 20 to 30 seconds just to get back into a position to try again. Combine that with the valves that are notorious for being barely missed and you have a very, very frustrating level. Regardless of these gripes, this level is very, very clean overall. And this would also serve as the basis for beginner routes for new runners later down the line. Burnside has a much higher score requirement to get bronze. In both of his heats, this combobulator would use the bull in the right of spawn to perform the tricks needed to get the bronze medal. Now, this also introduces a secondary mechanic to keep in mind. While yes, it is advised that you use a follow-up trick after a large combo. If you bail when you do this trick, you will suffer from a long getup animation. The points from the large combo will still tick down very slowly, and you will suffer a point penalty in the competition levels. Slowing down might, well, look slow, but it is needed to ensure that you don't fail this level. The penultimate level, Streets, is a true test for THPS1 speedrunners. In the earliest days of the game, Streets was thought to require multiple heats to complete all objectives. Luckily, this is any percent, and Discombobulator has less goals to complete here. We skip collecting the skate letters and destroying the cop cars in the any percent route. Instead, the major goal is to get pro score and get the secret tape over the gazebo. And let me tell you, there is nothing more heartbreaking in this game than being on a fantastic run and jumping too early and whiffing it, or the game decides to throw you in a completely different direction. He failed the first jump up to the spiral around the building, forcing him to get speed again, then reset up for the jump. He was able to get it on the second try, then perform a 720 fast plant into a backflip to get more than enough points he needed for pro score. At this point in the run, if you make it this far, nerves are at full power. Getting through the last gauntlet of levels and making the gazebo jump will make anyone nervous in this game. Under pressure, Discombobulator was able to get a good set of tricks to get special on the first jump. Then he was able to do a 720 nollie into a backflip on the second jump in each heat. And just like that, he was able to collect the third bronze medal and hit the credits. Overall, Discombobulator's first recorded any percent run will be 641 RTA and 516 IGT. After this run, there was a period where there was not a lot happening in the fledgling speedrunning community. The bar had been set, but there was just very little interest from other runners for one reason or another. There were some discussions on the SDA forums from time to time, but a lot of it was either treading on already discovered ground, or they just didn't go anywhere. But that doesn't mean things were quiet. As I mentioned previously, there were two groups that were working on this game. Tool assisted speedruns, also known as a task, are a variant of speedruns where you use special tools to complete runs as fast as possible. While speedrunning was about pushing the limits of the game for humans, a task was about pushing the game to its absolute limits. For others, it was a challenge to see how broken they could make a speedrun. Then there's also those who use the developer's own glitches and logic against the game to... Yeah, tassers are just built different. If you're interested in seeing more or learning more about how to make them, there are plenty of videos on YouTube or even taskvideos.org, the primary website for tool assisted speedrun discussion. Speaking of task videos, that is where the next part of the story will take place. A task videos user by the name of Spiderwaffle was interested in developing a brand new task of his own. Opening up a thread on the website, ask for advice on how to get started with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1. Over the next couple of posts, users would give support to the idea. But there were a few detractors who questioned if it was even a good idea to begin with. And Spider Waffle did make an extremely bold statement. Regardless of the detractors, theory crafting would begin. Midway through, some discussion began on whether the effort should be put into making a Pro Skater 3 task since it has reverts and manuals. A little later, Cyberwrath would jump in and tell the other posters of an upcoming SDA speedrun by Discombobulator. Many would consider them crazy, 
citing that a lot of backtracking might be required. After posting a text route, Spiderwaffle would come around to the idea of a single run streets and incorporate it into a soon to be made task. At least that's what I would like to say. The thread would soon die, only to be hijacked for various THPS projects. Out from this, and after losing motivation, Spiderwaffle would regain that momentum after meeting Emu, a prominent tasser who was working on his own THPS3 tasks. After that, the thread would die once again, and Pro Skater 1 would enter one of its longest lull periods. For the next few years, there was hardly any mention of the game in either of the communities. The game had gone completely silent. However, that would all change in 2010. After nearly three years of no discussion, there would be a new post in the same Pro Skater 1 task thread. While the video is gone, no surprise, it shows that interest in the game was still there. This player would go on to complete the Pro Skater 1 task and change the entire trajectory of the game forever. His name was Nahawk, and he is arguably one of the greatest innovators in the game's entire history. In his short career, Nahawk developed 12 tasks and some within the same few games. THPS1 was one of the games he chose to take on, taking inspiration from Spider Waffle's original posts and continued support through instant messages. He also gave additional thanks to Sonic Packer, who gave support and feedback throughout the process, and of course Discombobulator for his initial SDA run. As with all tool assisted speedruns, a lot of cool, unique, and batshit crazy tech and glitches were utilized allowing Nahawk to save 141 seconds against Discombobulator's time. This was the process where Nahawk also, as originally mentioned, figured out that there is no real difference between skaters' starting stats and trucks hardly affected gameplay, if at all. Because of this, and knowing he had plenty of points throughout the run, Nahawk selects the game's titular skater. Right off the bat, the first noticeable difference was the warehouse route. Discombobulator's run ran counterclockwise around the level, starting with the tape above the half pipe in the hidden room. Nahawk decided to use a special grind jump at the very beginning that would send him to the left side of the level and begin collecting objectives clockwise. Going on to school, there was also a major route change. Instead of circling around to the right, getting to the top of the skill buildings, and then using the plant to get closer to the secret tape, Nahawk opts to jump down toward the table below spawn, grab a bunch of points really quick, and then use a very quick wall jump up to the awning. Still a little low on points, he does a few more tricks, grabs the tape, and finishes school with blazing speed. Mall is where things get even crazier. While the first portion of the level is relatively straightforward, Nahawk implements two new major tricks. To start off with, there was a wall jump that was implemented up towards the second directory, allowing Nahawk to skip jumping up the awkward concrete fixture. Immediately after this, he would jump down to the pool below, grab the A, then use a fast plant to jump up towards the lights above and grab the secret tape, then jump down again to destroy the next directory. Chicago is relatively straightforward, even in a task setting. Nahawk determined that you only really need to be above 5,000 points in both heats to guarantee third place. As you would expect with downtown, the chaos would continue. Nahawk would perform what would infamously be called the downtown wall ride. From spawn, Nahawk performs the trick, grabs the tape, and flies back to the back of spawn and grabs the E. Then, well, he just kind of flies around the rest of the level really quickly, doing some really cool wall jumps into tricks along the way. Not done yet, Nahawk will perform one other magic trick in Downhill Jam. A task only trick, Nahawk performs a perfect fast plant to jump to the center pillar and grab the secret tape, then proceed on down to the second half of the level, skipping out on going around the entire outer perimeter. And to finish off the level, he opts to turn back around on the final valve instead of death warping down and use some very precise jumps and falls. Now, we get to Burnside where things reset a little bit. Burnside involves a preset combo that requires over 14,000 points in both heats. Nahawk jumps to the left of spawn and does some jumps into tricks into grinds to quickly attain the points he needs to proceed. With streets being the last non-competition level, Nahawk doesn't let up on the strats. Instead of going up to the street side quarter pipe to get up to the awning that runs around to the secret tape jump, Nahawk wall jumps from the side facing the park and proceeds up that way. Then, with a good nollie plus the 900 plus a kickflip, he gets more than enough points to finish the level. 
Honestly, I don't know what is crazier. The DHJ jump or someone actually lending the 900 in this game. In the final level of Roswell, Nahawk does a combo of grinds into tricks into even more grinds to get over 24,000 points in the first heat and over 26,000 points in the second heat, easily giving him more than enough for the bronze medal and finishing the task with blazing speed. Nahawk had made his mark on the community, but it would, once again, be a few more years before Pro Skater 1 would return to the spotlight. At the beginning of 2012, SDA was putting together their annual Awesome Games Done Quick Marathon. Commonly referred to as AGDQ, the event involved speedrunners from around the world coming together to hang out, celebrate their hobby, and raise money for charity. Pooh Train would show up at the event and show off Tony Hawk's Pro Skater to a very packed audience of speedrunners. Pooh Train would showcase the PS1 version of the game, getting a 1320 during the event. This would be the very first time a Tony Hawk game would appear at any marathon. Months later, the game would finally find stability. Instead of one or two runners randomly appearing, four new players would appear and join the fray. What originally drove you, Remedy, Fox, Tails, and Gwish to play Pro Skater 1? So for quite a while, I actually like started the whole thing by I was watching some like Super Mario 64 16 star speedruns. That's originally what got me into like Twitch and stuff. I think I saw a YouTube video on a 16 star run or something. And I was like, man, I really want to check this out. I think the reason I even started streaming was because I wanted to time a run and I just thought it'd be the easiest way. Like, oh, if I'm timing, I can just always look back and see what it was. And so when I started streaming, I had like two or three viewers. Gwished and some other people jumped in my stream and kind of pulled me in. I was like, hey, start speed running with us. And I was like, okay, this is cool. I found some friends really easily. And we started doing some pretty good 16 star races and that whole group formed. So me, Foxtails, Gwished, Remedy, um, some other people that didn't end up going to Tony Hawk. But we played SM64 for a good while, maybe maybe four or five months. And we really enjoyed the grind of it, like watching our times. And one day we were just kind of sitting around and we were all going to do probably some races, maybe some bingo for SM64. And we all just kind of were like, I wonder what other games we could kind of run. And so I posed the question to the group. I was like, well, what games did you guys play as a kid that you just loved? So we started looking at some childhood games. And I was, I was sitting there one day and I was like, what about one of the Tony Hawk games? And everybody was like, oh, I, I kind of thought that was just for score. And I was like, yeah, but can we beat it? And so very quickly we found that old that old any percent run on speed demos archive and uh, we watched through it all together and the first time we watched it i was kind of talking through the whole thing and i was like oh i think i think i could do this like i'm a pretty good tony hawk player like i'm no joke i, I used to really sit and grind those games on my own as a kid just for fun like really came from my love of skateboarding and so w while we were watching the original run i was like i okay i think i can do this like I think we can do this, we can do this. And then there's a single obvious mistake in downhill, or not downhill jam, sorry, in San Francisco. In the original run that was put, put on Speed Do Demo's archive, there's a very obvious mistake. He goes up for the secret tape, hits the wall, bonks, has to reset up and go. And I was like, guys, we can world record this. Like, I can do those first six levels or whatever it was. I can hit that first try, like it's a grind. And everybody kind of agreed. They're like, yeah, actually, hold on. I think we can world record this. And like, we started doing more research. There was a task up at the time. So we started looking at the task and I noticed one or two things where I'm like, well, the task does this and it doesn't look difficult. Like, I'm not sure what's actually happening if they're doing some crazy input to get a boneless off that ledge or something, but it looks easy enough. And so we just kind of started running and relatively quickly we were down close. The group would begin to race in December leading up into the new year. While there was the occasional personal best on their individual streams, a lot of time, optimization, and practice came from racing against one another. While they all enjoyed the Super Mario 64 bingo races, Pro Skater 1 brought out something new from each of them. Before long, armed with an ever-increasing game sense, skyrocketing potential, increased consistency, and collecting multiple personal bests, the SDA record would eventually fall. On January 4th, 2013, Men United would become the first to overtake Discombobulator's run. Playing on an N64 emulator, Men United selected Jeff Rowley and began his run. Compared to the SDA run, there were a few key differences. Going into school, he would go for the building wall ride up to the Yanni and get closer to the secret tape. For Maul, he wouldn't go for the wall ride up to the second directory, 
but would go for and nail the fountain jump up to the secret tape. Downtime was mostly the same between both runs, with Man United having his first major mistake with missing the fast plant to grab the tee underneath the catwalk. The natural hop of the skate letters is problematic in very, very niche situations. The tee in downtown is no different. If you have a less than perfect fast plant in the letter bobs up, you're going to miss it. Regardless of the miss, Man United was still on pace. Burnside would not go according to plan, meaning Man United would have to perform the wall ride in streets to get ahead of world record. Nerves were high. I played that so safe, holy fuck. <sighs> Come on. Oh, watch me play this, it's like bringing back all the memories. <laughs> Come on, hit the tape. Oh my god, I got the tape. You? Dude, I'm up. I'm up 10 seconds of world record. <sighs> oh my god. Oh my god, okay, hold on. <sighs> Don't poof it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm going safe strats. Oh my god, my heart is pounding. Come on, 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 Jeff. Oh my god, I'm shaking. Like, you have no idea. <laughs> oh no, come on, Jeff, come on. Come on, Jeff. With this run, Man United would be the very first player to overcome the SDA record with a 635.16. Even with a disastrous mid-game, he was able to keep his nerves in check and step out from Discobobulator's shadow. How did yeah. it feel? Uh, insane. You did like quickly too, it was like two or three months or something like that? Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's tough for me to even say. It wasn't so long. Um, I will say, like I said, Gwish and, and Remedy would be up in the morning playing. And Wish was not a slouch at Tony Hawk to begin with, but I definitely had this, I don't know. I, I had this obsession as a kid, especially like Tony Hawk 1 and 3 specifically. Um, those two games, I, I played two a lot, but it kind of skipped over me a little bit. But those two games, I just had so much playtime in and just like this like disorder type obsession where I just like, I just love playing them. They just brought me to this very happy place as a kid. And I was young. I think when I played Tony Hawk one, uh, what year did it come out? 1999. Yeah. So I must've only been six years old. I was born in 93. So, you know, pretty young, but it just, just grabbed me. So anyway, so yeah, I, uh, I had just this rush of feelings. I, I remember going into that run. I was talking with my friend, Mike, and I remember maybe halfway through, I told him, I was like, Hey, I'm on one. Like, I don't remember the line I said, but like, I'm like, I'm feeling it. This is it. And uh, I, I remember going into Roswell and looking over at my time. And I like, I wish at the time it was more popular to have heart rate monitors on when you were in Twitch. Cause I <laughs> like, man, I'll tell you, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty decent athlete. I played water polo for, you know, all my like childhood and into my early adult life. I've never had my heart pump like that, man. There, there was this nostalgic, like just immaculate feeling of, I finally accomplished something that my younger self would have been excited for. And you know, like as, as you get older, you do things that you're, you're proud of, but like your younger self maybe would have been like, oh, it's, it's an adult thing to do. But like as a kid, like, you know, uh, at that point it was maybe 12 years later, I was like, oh, I did this thing that as a kid, I would have been like, oh, that's the coolest thing in the world. So there was this kind of like rush of kid-like awesomeness and it was something that i pushed for for a long time it's it's not just like you know even when i say it i'm like oh yeah i pushed for three months for uh it doesn't seem like a lot i know some people do certain speedrun records and they push for years but three months putting in and no joke maybe a 16 hour days and you do it out of love but when you look back on it those those three months or really probably the year that i ended up doing tony hawk for feels like a five or six year period in my life and so hitting the record even though it was sort of towards the beginning of the whole adventure was kind of like definitely the the peak for me and i was just excited to be over that peak early and i kind of went into this role of like let me find skips and and new techniques for remedy and gwish to work on because they have this they have these like mechanical gifts that i just don't have uh, i can get good at video games but they can get perfect at them and so i give them the tools once they pass me on mechanical ability they were just gone around four hours later 
Remedy would respond with a time of his own, taking down the SDA record with a 639.xx. I say XX because the video, while technically available, does not work any longer and just displays a black screen. Thanks, Switch. Two days later, Remedy would get a 629, then a 619 in the very same day. I'm 620. This run solidified Remedy as the man to be in the 80% category and fully began his reign as the best player around. 12 days later, Remedy would further his lead against the other players by knocking down the time to a 606. His movement was more solid, and a change to the Burnside route helped him just a little bit more in time. However, it wasn't enough with a sub 6, but it was all within reach. Wait, I can gain like two seconds. So I think I can. It's like a 549. Oh no! Get, uh, no, what'd you do? I like. stopped spinning by accident. And it slipped 552. In less than two months of playing, not only was the SDA record broken, but the sub 6 barrier had been shattered with Remedy's 552 carried by even better movement, execution, and the implementation of Nahawk's straight wall jump. Remedy was able to continue to break ground and push any percent past a major milestone. Not to be outdone, his friends would not be too far behind. By the time the 552 was attained, Bush had a 645 and was working hard to reduce the gap between himself and Remedy. Man United and Fox Hills, due to their videos being lost, have unknown 80% times going forward. However, their race activity on Speedruns Live would show that they are still playing and improving, giving credit to the idea they were not too far behind either. Remedy would not let up the pressure and continued his crusade on 80%. Two weeks later, on February 3rd, 2013, Remedy improved to a 543, this time incorporating the mall wall ride to the second directory and implementing a new version of the DHJ secret tape jump that was more easily doable by humans. Of these two tricks, the mall wall ride is far easier to hit, requiring a good jump, good speed, and a good and quick wall jump. Conveniently, there's also a ledge all the way to the jump that gives you the perfect angle. All you would need is good speed and a good wall jump to make it. Meanwhile, the DHJ jump was something that eluded the group for some time. So uh, we're watching the task one day, trying to just find little things to improve. And I looked at the, the what we call the mall ride, the little wall ride up the right side up to the secret tape area. And uh, I told Gwish, I was like, why can't you do this? Like, I don't, like, we do a way faster wall ride on school sometimes. Like, if you overdo your grind in the beginning of school, the inputs needed to fix that wall ride so much faster than what are needed in, in the mall. And Gwish was like, oh, yeah, you're right. And I think within an hour, we all had it. Like, it was just something so stupid that we had never done. Especially so, since it was, it's, the game practically gives you the setup, too. Yeah, it's it's like, I mean, it's damn near built in. Yeah, it, it's strange that we just didn't. I, I couldn't tell you why. It just seemed like a difficult thing. And maybe it was at the beginning, but I think really grinding that school strat down uh, really helped us in that. So I remember I told Remedy and Gwish both, and maybe even Foxtails. I was like, I think this downhill jam strat is viable. Like, all they're doing is getting a special grind for the bonus speed. They're just cutting right. And... Gwish and Remedy being the smart ones are like, well, his angle landing off the rail has got to be perfect because you can't just land and then make a right turn. You don't have enough room to get the turn off and you'll miss the tape. And if you land too far right, you're either going to cut your speed too much or you're just going to bail. And so I gave it probably like three or four days of like save state practice. Like, so, I mean, I put in thousands uh, and I'm not kidding. I put in thousands of attempts on the very original way that the uh, original TAS has that downhill jump. And I was like, yeah, it's not possible. And somewhere towards the tail end of it, I was just kind of tired of trying the same thing over and over. And I turned to the left and did a backflip. And I didn't even have to do the jump. I was in the middle of the backflip. And I remember just setting my controller down and laughing. And I was like, I what have I been doing? Like, why am I <laughs> not looking at the bigger picture here? And I remember I showed Gwished it and Remedy. I, I saved it. I think I uploaded it to YouTube. God, years ago, like as an unlisted video just to show him. And I remember Remedy just goes, damn it. <laughs> He's like, I have to learn this. I'm like, it's so easy. Don't even worry about it. And like Gwish was upset. They both were kind of upset with 
Um, and that was, I guess, sort of passive. That was kind of the thing. I'd bring them something, and very often they were like, damn it. Like, why? Like, why do you find these things? Because it's now, you know, in my run during San Francisco, I've got to throw this strat in. And it's like, if I fall, the run's over. Like, why do you find these things? Just leave it alone. <laughs> Remedies 543 was the first run to incorporate this brand new trick. And he would then go on to beat it once more in two weeks with a 531. Foxtails would catch back up with a 548. And Gwitch would be right behind him with a 605. By the end of February, the motivation had begun to die down. They accomplished their goals, and the allure of a certain Italian plumber was calling them back home. For now, the first major rivalry in the series' history had come to a close. Remedy would return in July 2013, and immediately knock his run down to a 528. Even with an unforced bail and maw upon loading in, a very good downtime would bring him back, only to scuff the DHJ tape jump and knocking him back into the red. But, Remedy had a new trick up his sleeve. In Burnside, he would forego the safe strategy of jumping to the left side of the park and using the ramps to gain points. Instead, he made a new strategy of gaining special very quickly, then timing a fast plant perfectly on a small hill to give him just enough height for a spinning backflip. He failed performing the trick correctly in the first heat, sending him even further into the red. Then, a slow street was sent to 4.8 seconds behind his personal best. Luckily, for this run, he had at least 6.1 seconds to save according to his best segment in Roswell. Remedy would do a quick combo to gain special and jump up the ramp to perform a fast flight into a heel flip into a spinning backflip. In the end, this knocked off a extra jump in both heats, saving over 7 seconds by itself, securing Remedy the sub 530 and gaining a new world record. Fucking there. Right there. Surely, if he got a record with those big of mistakes, Another record should be easy to attain. Fast forward a few days to July 13th, and he would get a better time, a 521. While a VOD is gone due to Twitch being a wonderful website, he commented on the video saying he had a 14 second time loss in Burnside. And I can only imagine he failed to jump in both heats and had to do a backup to get points needed to continue. Remarkably, he would still get a new record, further fueling him to push for a possible sub five. Remedy would eventually settle on a two-second improvement on August 19th. That's a fucking... That's a world record. Are you kidding me? That doesn't... That's bullshit. Less than optimal movement and execution would stop him from improving further. What? I fucking hit... Flip trick. I hit C left. By accident. Um... After fighting once again for well over a month, Remedy would take another break from the game. By the time Remedy would pause his efforts, Gwished and Men United would return. Not to improve their times in any percent, no. Instead, they wanted to fight it out in a lesser touched category. 100%. 100% is, in almost every respect, the same run as any percent. To recap, Completing an any percent run requires at least 26 of the 30 available tapes in the game to unlock Roswell. Of the four tapes skipped during this time, two are in school, and the other two are in streets. For 100%, you need all tapes and get golds in each competition. In their new quest, Man United would strike first with a 9.37 on November 11, 2013, collecting the first sub-10 in the category's short history. Yes! Just woke that up. <laughs> yes! Yes! He would also showcase a new Chicago strat that would go on to be the main beginner strat going forward. He would get special in a decent amount of points with one jump, then perform a fast plant into a spinning backflip on the second. His reign would not last for long, however. Twist would challenge Man United to a 100% race. Twist would play out of his mind and get a 916 and take the record. Dude, you totally had enough after the second backflip. Oh, damn. Uh... What's a 916? That's a good... Record. Yeah, that's good enough. Is that recorded world record? Yep. Yeah. Nice. Then the next day, Men United would strike down the new 100% king with a very solid 824 run. 
or anything else where it involves going like too fast. Oh, new universe record, A24. Really? Yes. He cleaned up the mistakes seen in both his and Gwish's runs. Then, one week later, Men United would go for one final speedrun. Yes! Yes! Finishing with a then spectacular time and taking down the eight minute barrier would cap off Men United's speedrunning career. Satisfied, he would step away from the scene entirely, save for watching and coaching his friends from the sidelines. Wish would not be too far behind, securing a 7.52 on November 27th and taking the record once again. Yahoo! <laughs> With the holidays approaching, Wish would take another break from THPS1 updating his record and Johnny Bazooka Tone in the process. Alright, that could have been better, but it could have been a lot worse. Realistically, I guess the reason I stopped playing was because Gwish and Remedy were so far ahead of me in consistency. Not, not so much mechanical skill. I could do the tricks they were doing, but they were consistently getting times within one or two seconds, and I was consistently getting times within... 10 to 15 seconds they were just very very good they're not the reason i stopped but they were definitely a part of it just because i was like okay these guys like even if i tell them hey i have this idea for this trick i, I remember one thing i spent I, I mean what could seem like a madman's time amount of i think i remember a, a weekend where like I, i'm not sure i got off my computer i was just trying to get the san francisco tape without going onto the damn roof I told Remedy, I was like, hey, I have these three ideas for this tape. And he immediately got closer than I did. I was like, okay, I'm just going to tell them my ideas. Like, I, I don't need to play this game anymore. They've got it. And it was okay to me. I never, never hated them or had any issue with it. Like, I was just, I thought it was cool. And it kind of played in, I'm a teacher now. And it just kind of, I think, kind of played into it. Like, I think it was kind of a good role for me. I was kind of the coach on the sideline, more or less. But yeah, they just... They were mechanically better. They were consistently better. So any ideas I had, any any novelty that I could bring to the team, I didn't even need to touch the control anymore. So By February 2014, THPS1 would see the return of several old and new players in the racing scene. Wished and Remedy would return to the game, and a player who had had some interest in the game for years now, George the Plushie. The races went on for some time, allowing Gwish and Remedy to de-rust after almost three months away before plunging once more into any percent. Remedy, still feeling the burnout, would eventually play less and less, joining in every so often and play with friends when time allowed. Off the heels of his world record in THPS4 any percent, George would pick up and learn the THPS1 any percent route and begin to grind out times. Within a few weeks, George would go from a 622 then down to a 558 before taking a very small break. With a new challenger to the scene, Wished would have to pick up the pace, but he had a new trick up his sleeve. Considered by every top runner to be the hardest trick in the game, the downtown wall ride saved many seconds from the older, slower way of ascending the buildings to get to the secret tape. The task posted years ago by Nahawk used a slightly different version, but this was the earliest version known to be accomplished by a human player. And talking personally as a runner of the game, I can vouch for its difficulty. Similar to the task, the downtown wall ride required special, good speed, a very acute angle to the wall, and a very fast wall jump. Failure of any of these would make the trick more difficult or straight up impossible to hit. In the end, he would finish with a 534. Remedy would have a response. Yes! Finally! God damn it! Fuck! Oh my god! Finally! 
Jesus Christ. That's, that's it, man. That's that's it. I don't know. It's, I don't know. Oh, fuck. I'm like I'm happy with that run. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do now. On March 8th, Remedy would post his final speedrun in THPS1. Remedy would become the very first player to take down the five minute barrier. After months of on and off grinding, hundreds to thousands of hours of practice and playtime, and combining the efforts of years of community work, Remedy would get a 457. It would not be until mid 2019 when he would finally be taken out of the top three in the category, cementing his status as one of the game's greatest players. After his monumental run, Summer Games Done Quick, the sister marathon to Awesome Games Done Quick, was right around the corner. Wished Remedy and George would submit THPS 1 as a three-way race. George was also able to get THPS 3 accepted and bring even more Tony Hawk to the masses. During the lead-up to their SGDQ 2014 run, George was able to figure out that there was a fundamental difference in load times and lag between the N64's pre-installed jumper pack and the expansion pack. I was watching somebody's stream, and I just couldn't help notice that the levels were loading so much faster than what I, what, I mean, even if it's just like a few frames, really, I mean, like, it, it's very noticeable when you're so used to how long levels load with expansion pack that okay these levels are definitely loading faster it i don't know if i asked or if it if i just noticed like a, on a reboot or something that i don't know but anyway curiosity paid off i guess and i want to i'm not i'm not entirely sure but I'm, i want to say that you have the game performs a little better with expansion pack in terms of like like lag frames in certain spots but like you can avoid lag frames if you just know where they are days prior to the event on june 19th george would take his first thps1 world record in 100 percent the 718 shout out to the world record <laughs> He lost over 10 seconds of mall due to missing a skate letter, and even more time by failing an entire heat for Burnside. But even then, he was able to secure the record before the big event. I'm Man United. I'm Fox. I'm Ness Kamikaze. George. Uh, I'm George. <laughs> uh, uh, Remedy. Remedy. <laughs> if you heard that. Yeah. Uh, we picked someone who can either do a front flip or a back flip uh, due to the N64 version allowing you to spin and give you a stupid amount of points very quickly with multipliers. Are right, you guys ready? Uh, yeah. Right. Three, two, one, go. Um, so Jamie Thomas has a front flip, um, which George prefers, but most other people will be doing back flips with Jeff Rowley. Um, Jamie Thomas also has an easier grind, um, but it's all preference. Nice, um, nice. So right here, he's gonna come and hit the A and grind across this. This was at once believed to be a TAS only strat, um, but after some manipulation with the way we do it, and that was fantastic. That was really good. Um, it's extremely tough. The fast plant has to be very perfect and you have to have full speed. Um, um, any kind of bobble will not get you it. And uh, nice job. So what's, what's pretty impressive is he actually almost cleared the tape, um, and that can actually be more devastating than just missing it. I mean, all the contests are pretty much the same. Just throw a backflip and no, spin. No, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so he actually messed up. A 900 backflip there can give you a pretty heavy uh, point differential between a 720 and a 900. Uh, <laughs> Remedy actually has a pretty good chance of catching him right here with good execution, and the fact that George can't backflip. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's close. That's Run! No, oh, no! He didn't get it! Time! Time. <laughs> so, a thing about 100% is you need all golds, and to come up bronze like that is heartbreaking. It's pure. It's that's not, not bad. That's, that's not bad. You got
the, uh, um, <laughs> actually, the, the world record has been beaten several times since we've been here for 100%. Yeah, three times. Three times. Uh, first, it was Remedy. No, it was George. Uh, it was actually. George first. Um, it's like 712. Yeah, they got a 712. Then Remedy did, uh, yeah, he cut the 7, 655, and George didn't appreciate that and pulled a 645. Um, there were still mistakes in the run, uh, from what he says, but uh, they weren't anything too major. It was a few seconds. It's, it's insane. <laughs> So Steve right now, uh, Gwished, it did the best cheat code in any game. Uh, a lot of people think it's a Konami code, but it's not. Uh, it's actually Tony Hawk's wife's face. Uh, don't know why it's in the game, uh, but you know, it's fun to do runs like that. Uh, you know. It reduces lag on the screen. Yep. <laughs> we don't know if that's true, but we hope it is, because we do it, so. With SGDQ 2014 in the books, Gwish would take another break from the game and speedrunning in general. George, however, had other plans. During the summer of 2014, George would jump between THGS 1, 2, and 3. On July 8th, he would get a 520 in THGS 1 any percent. This would be the last time he would play the game in 2014, moving his focus towards the other two games in the series, all culminating in a multi-game relay on August 31st. Pro Skater 1 would return to its slumber once more for the rest of 2014. Come March 5th, 2015, Gwish would return in remarkable fashion. He would get a 456.78 and THPS won any percent, stealing the record away from Remedy by fractions of a second. The only major mistake he made during the run was fast planting to the K over the fountain in downtown. With the rest of his time save coming from performing special tricks in a few more areas, and optimizing his movement just enough. With the 80% crown, he set his sights on gaining the 100% record and began to grind out runs. Two months later. And that is a 10 second PD, actually an 11 second PD. Then beat it the next day with a 710. Well, After grinding on and off for a few more months, he would get his next PB on November 10th and get a 651. He was within seconds of taking the 100% record. Then, 10 days later... Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I fucking did it. <sighs> Holy shit. Elated, but not done yet, Wish would continue to grind out runs in IL times to improve himself. With Remedy done playing the game and George taking a long hiatus, Wish was alone to grind out his times. Going into 2016, Gwish would immediately improve his any percent times with a 455.92 on January 24th, a 453.39 on February 6th, and then a 448.17 on February 8th. However, someone had a message for the king of Pro Skater 1. George would immediately make his presence known to the growing THBS community by utilizing the warehouse task route created by Spiderwaffle and Nahawk many years prior. He had attempted the route during SGDQ 2014, but it was generally avoided because of its difficulty. George was able to do a very similar route that had him move right, get special, then grind the middle quarter pipe towards the boxes and skate letters. From there, you would get the rest of the objectives clockwise and finish up with getting the tape. This greatly improved on the last route and giving George a 19 second in-game time. 
a time that would take an additional three years to beat. Even with this new trick, sloppy play would prevent George from getting a larger PB, settling on a 518. Wish would, instead, focus his efforts on 100%. Through the next few months, he would continue to grind the category out whenever real life would allow him, all while George worked to optimize his play even further. On June 12th, Wish would be rewarded with a 642 and 100%. One of the biggest mistakes he made in the run was failing to get the secret tape in the mall, being forced to use the new mall backup. Right below the tape's rails, there is a kicker that is perfectly positioned for you to wall ride off of. With good speed and a good jump, you can make it back up to the tape and continue your run. Obviously, this will lose time, but it is a very solid backup for new runners to utilize. On June 13th, Gwish would be rewarded with a very good run of 639 and 100%. All that lay before him in near perfection were three issues. One with missing the A in downtown, another with missing a cop car in streets, and a scuffed Roswell heat. Gwish would implement a new Roswell strategy that was a little faster than spinning backflip. By jumping to the left and doing some precise tricks and grinds, one could achieve all the points necessary to get bronze. Days later, on June 18th, George would get a 505 and start pushing his times down even further to make good on his earlier comments. Then he would become the third player to get a sub-5 in TPS1 with a 454. As his attempt counter continued to rise, so did his confidence that he would get the record soon. Around this time, feeling additional burnout from the game, Gwish would take a small break, leaving George all alone. On June 25th, George would finish what he started. Honestly, if you ever wanted confirmation that George was some sort of robot, this is as close as you will ever get. Jokes aside, the run was very clean, affording very little mechanical mistakes and having a clean run with no bails a feat that is extremely hard to achieve even at the highest levels of play. So the microphone thing, like somebody had said in the chat, like, I can kind of understand what he's saying. So I'm like, okay, it must not be that bad. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and then you play back the run and it's like, you can't understand. It's just garbled noise. So I, in terms of like the actual run, I mean, like, I don't feel like I was incredibly happy with that time anyway uh, even then like but so part of the part of i guess like the secret of me is like i'll get i'll get i'll get a record and just be like okay well i guess i'm fine for now even even if it's not like super great or up to my best potential so i have been grinding thps1 any percent for a little bit for those like couple weeks as you said but i don't know like that was i feel like the first like actual decent run i actually got that just didn't have any huge mistakes and i just took it and just left it there <laughs> this achievement sent shockwaves throughout the entire tony hawk community by this point players had begun to catch up to his pro skater 2 pro skater 3 pro skater 4 and american wasteland times often acting as the final boss that required you to commit time patience, hours of practice, and skill to overcome. But, out of almost nowhere, George destroys one of the most difficult times in the franchise, seemingly with ease. Needless to say, this record sent a clear message to everyone. No record was truly safe. Those worries, however, would not come to pass, at least for now. As of the making of this video, this would be George's final submitted time in Pro Skater 1. He would refocus into THPS3 to push the time further away from numerous challengers that were beginning to catch up to him. Is there any plans to play another game in the future, or are you just kind of mostly happy with what you've done so uh, done in the community? You know, never, never say never. <laughs> I never did get a recorded time better than current 100% time in Tony Hawk One. So there's that. So that's kind of like a stain on on the speedrun.com 
page. And people tend to bring it up enough that it probably needs to be addressed at this point, especially when auto kickoff and on rune glyph berg strats and everything exists that probably just need to go ahead and, and beat it at some point. Wished would continue his hiatus from the game, moving to Proto Skater 2 to begin challenging the Packle at any percent while improving his record in all golden golds. Once again, the game was poised to fall into a deep slumber. With its kings moving away to other games, no one knew when the next challenger would arise to challenge the status quo. And for the rest of 2016, this rung true. 2017, however, that would change. 2017 was poised to be another quiet year. 80% and 100% were pushed very hard by George and Gwisht, and the barrier to contend was the highest it had ever been. While many would pick up the game and begin to grind out runs, it was becoming more and more known that it would take an insane amount of commitment to even get close to the top three players. The skill gap between the top three players, George, Gwisht, and Remedy, and everyone else just seemed like a large obstacle to overcome. The game's optimization was at the point now where a lot of extremely hard tricks were required to attain a halfway decent time, and even one mistake would mean upwards to dozens of seconds of time loss. One bail in the wrong spot would have cost you the entire run, since momentum, gaining back special, then gaining speed could immediately give you a 15 to 20 second time loss. Playing less than optimal meant more time loss. You have to play aggressive in THPS1 to get good times. You have to know the mechanics of each trick, understand the level's geometry, master the movement tech, and acquire the extreme willpower to continue fighting the game and bend it to your will. And above all, you have to learn to be patient. Most new runners would instead opt for Underground 1, Underground 2, or American Wasteland, due in part to them being more forgiving and requiring less time to get reasonable results. At this point, it was unknown when a new player would rise to challenge the status quo. Weeks prior to the second community marathon, a new runner would join the fray and immediately make a splash. With a respectable 6.15 at any percent, Nami would showcase that they would become a threat in the near future. The run itself was rough around the edges, but Nami was willing to learn and understand the game. And, coming from a background where they played the game plenty of times casually, Nami already knew the engine well enough to be well ahead of their nearest competition, even if the times didn't reflect that idea just yet. What started as a 6.15 in January would be dwindled down to a 5.27 on September 13th. After being satisfied with their improvements, they moved to 100% on the same day, beginning with a respectable time of 11.34. By December 22nd, they would have knocked down over 4 minutes to get a 7.08. What brought you to the series, and specifically what made you pick up Pro Skater 1? I mean, I think every kid in the 90s, first of all, to, to go back to the beginning a bit, every kid in the 90s, or most kids, had the skate skateboarding phase, and I definitely had that when I was like seven, eight, not long before the game came out. So, you know, it was, it was like a huge deal when one came out. I still think that was probably the peak of skating popularity, at least for kids. So, you know, I played it a bunch casually as a kid and for a long time and not the whole series, but a lot of the early games at least. And so then when I can't remember if it was GDQ 2015 or 2016. I think 2015 was the first one I watched that one of my friends um, got me interested in, my friend Shane. I, I know Tony Hawk wasn't in that marathon, but when I was thinking through my head of like games that I played and really liked, and I was thinking like, what game would I like to see speedrun the most? I remember Tony Hawk coming up and I, I went back to the old VODs and I think it was 2014. I don't remember when Gwish's solo run was, because I, I don't think I actually saw that one until much later. But I remember seeing the race, and George tried the the task route and warehouse in that race. And uh, that's also where George George gets, gets second in Roswell, and he loses because of it. He like barely gets second. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it was a really Sorry, hype dude. ending. And so that it was honestly that race, I think, that made me go like, I want to try doing that. Up until this point, THPS1 had been very straightforward with how it plays. There are, like all games, glitches, bugs, and anomalies galore, but none have truly helped out speedrunners. Compared to other popular games on the system, THPS1 was surprisingly resilient to exploits and glitches. Instead, runners had to rely on good routing, excellent movement, and superb execution to get the times they wanted. Of note, there was the infamous tier glitch 
that can make the game do weird things. You save your game as TYR, it, you, it gets rid of the score and it gets rid of your time display and it changes all the in-game text to RxJPYHMB. Uh, I have no idea what that is all about. <laughs> um, the other thing it does, that I'll show right now, all the menus and everything, um, is you cannot complete a competition. Um, <laughs> There's Tony's ex-wife. Without crashing the game completely. And that's there Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. What a game. <laughs> and even more strange is that there are a total of 2,170 names that can trigger this glitch. Sometimes, all it takes is just one person to enter the scene and turn the entire game upside down. This one person, or eventually group of people, don't normally speedrun, instead electing to hunt glitches to help support the scenes they are in. They are aptly named glitch hunters and can frequently think very outside of the box. Enter THPS's prominent glitch hunter, Backside Grind. Also known as BS Grind, he had been around the scene for some time. He helped Theory craft some strategies, including a potential time save in THPS2 with a gold duplication glitch. BS Grind began to slowly gain acclaim for his strategies and new glitches. It took some time, but his work was always worth it. On February 1st, 2018, BS Grind, George, Adeline, and Nami would encounter a brand new glitch that would finally penetrate the seemingly invincible armor of THPS1. After a bit of back and forth to figure out what was happening, it was eventually determined that soft resetting the game, such as Z plus start on N64, would, yes, soft reset the game, but doing it in specific points would yield strange results. Immediately, the new Game Plus category was added, the first new category in over a decade. Dubbed the new Game Plus, or NG Plus glitch, it was discovered that THPS1 does not completely remove all flags from memory upon soft resetting. Using a pre-made save in a competition, loading and completing the competition, and then soft resetting on the results screen of the second heat sends you back to the main menu. After waiting around 25 seconds, the game would send you to a quick demo of the game. From there, players could press pause to bring up an invisible menu, then scroll down to where end competition should be. Upon doing so, the burner would be free to save, luckily with the menu showing now. Then, to clear memory completely, they would restart their console entirely. Do this two more times, and you have completed the NG Plus category. George would go for the first run of the category the next day, getting a 330 flat. Using a slightly different strategy, Nami would beat their run again with a 310 on the next day. While the category would see very little activity from this point onwards, BS Grind had already made his mark. While the contributions of NG Plus could go to a number of runners, he was the first to notice this glitch and help bring it to fruition. While the glitch forced a new category, it showed to everyone that there was still plenty to be discovered. And BS Grind was just getting started. Two weeks later, on February 15th, BS Grind would find a new optimization for Downhill Jam. Consider tasks only. It involves gaining some speed from a special grind, going up the quarter pipe on the dam to get the skate letter and to do a special trick, then doing an insanely precise jump over to the tape with the momentum you collected. This trick was estimated to save around one second over the task route and might be possible for a human to perform. Over the next few weeks, BS Grind would mess with the new trick, eventually determining that N64 was a lot more consistent overall to PS1. Additionally, he found out that this jump was one of the extreme edge cases where stats do matter, requiring a minimum of 25 tapes to even be possible. Eventually, after grinding the trick for tens of hours, he would move on to other theories and tricks he could attempt. This would all be capped off when Nami finally hitting the trick on an N64 console 
with Jamie Thomas at 25 tapes. And once more, he would come through with a new optimization on March 26th, this time showcasing something that was entirely possible for a human to perform. Within the menus of THPS1 in the later games, there rests an option that, at first, doesn't seem too great. Auto Kick is a strange feature that showed up in THPS1 and would be prevalent for the vast majority of the series. On by default, Auto Kick is supposed to increase your speed by holding down the Ollie button at the cost of some acceleration and extra air. By disabling it, you would be forced to hold down the flip button to push yourself. While the top speed was nominal, this speed boost would knock off several seconds throughout the run. Nami would go on to tie Gwish's nearly perfect 36 second mall time a few days later, crediting Auto Kick being turned off. Afterwards, the game went into another state of theory crafting and optimizations. For the rest of 2018, BS Grind would include new tricks and routes he had found. While they would be out for most of 2018 due to their real life situation, Nami would continue to improve their times and individual levels and work up to either a world record position or very close to it. Within a relatively short time span of the game's history, and with the newly acquired trick of auto kick, Nami was beginning to pose themselves as the next threat within the game. And with 2018 slowly ticking away, they would continue to practice and practice and practice. Come the new year, Nami would immediately showcase what they had learned. On January 14th, 2019, they would get a 659.5 and 100%, only 20 seconds away from Gwish. Losing a lot of time in downtown, Burnside, and streets, it not only showed that Gwish 639 could be beaten, but that the category was still a long way from being optimized. While the footage isn't available, Nami mentioned that they PB at any percent on April 6th with a round at 515, followed up by a last frame 44 second downhill jam and would tie the 100% record with a 639. A few days later, they would tie it once again, noting that they restarted street 7 seconds in. It was only a matter of when, not if. On April 12th, Nami would take the hoodie wearing Jamie Thomas, auto kick, and new route optimizations, and finally defeated Gwish's record with a 635. With issues here and there, with one being a wasted heat in Roswell due to bailing, Nami would begin their crusade to improve the category further and further. Almost a month later, BS Grind would post a brand new major finding. This time, he discovered that the controller setup menu has oddities related to how the buttons are mapped. Being another N64 exclusive glitch, it would allow you to map two commands to the same button. Nami developed their own controller scheme and posted it on their mechanics guide as follows. Change C left to grind slide. Change C down to grind slide. Press A. C up will automatically change to jump ollie and C down to flip trick. Change these both back to grind slide and press A again. This time C up and C left automatically switch to say flip trick. Change them both back to grind slide one more time. Hover the cursor over C down and press A. All three should say grind slide now, but in game C up does nothing, C left is flip trick, and C down is both jump ollie and grind slide together. C right remains grab trick as normal. You got that? Yeah, as I mentioned, it's a complicated glitch, but its benefits could be immediately felt. Combined with auto kick being turned off, this would allow certain tricks to become much easier. For example, the downtown wall ride was notorious for destroying runs and runners alike. The config glitch made this much simpler to pull off and less likely for runs to fail. However, for his next trick, BS Grind found a new glitch on June 6th that would once again break the game open and force another category to be added to the leaderboards. With this glitch, you would choose Bob Pernquest and load into career mode. Immediately quit the run, soft reset, go into a different mode and highlight Roswell, exit to the main menu, and wait for the demo to start. Once the demo started, you could press start to bring up the invisible menu and press the A button twice to force a new heat. You would have control of the skater in the demo mode and the game would get very confused and think you are in Roswell to complete the competition. After completing two heats with over 30,000 points, you would be awarded a medal just like normal. 
The category was named a 0%, with different revisions of the route being found by BS Grind to save even more time. The next revision involved saving a replay onto your N64 memory card, soft resetting back to the main menu, going back into career mode and choosing your skater, then hovering your selection over a competition level. Afterwards, you would go back to the main menu again, go into extras, and load your replay you just saved. Then the game would get very, very confused on where you are at, thinking you are in the level you hovered over previously, and just like the other method, you complete it three times to complete all three competition levels in the first section of Warehouse. Just a little bit confusing. Several days later, on the 11th of June, Nami would submit a time of 1.57. That's kind of fast, but then they would come back the very next day with a 1.46. After this, Nami would go back to any percent to begin the conquest for their final world record. Probably not quite enough. Let's just be safe here. Oops. Oh no. Oh my god, I barely got sub 5. I don't think I even beat Remedy. I got a 458. On June 19th, they would get a 458 and become the fourth player to ever get a sub 5 in any percent. With this run, Nami would incorporate the first major route change in years. Previously, runners would opt to get the three tapes from school, which are high score, pro score, and the secret tape. Instead, they were going to get all the tapes in one run. This would mean that they can remove two tapes later in the run, opting to remove collecting the skate letters and destroying the skate signs during downtown. Overall, the route change would be around 1.5 to 2 seconds slower than the old route if you had an optimal downtown to begin with. However, in all practicality, the differences were very small, but this route change allowed Nami to more easily and consistently get runs into downhill jam and onwards. Nami would not get another try for another two months. Upon their return, Nami would have a brand new weapon, the actual best skater option in the entire game. Throughout this video, we have seen Tony Hawk, Jeff Rowley, Jimmy Thomas, and even Bob Burnquist. Each of them have the good special tricks and are fairly easy to pull off since they have a low amount of frames required to succeed. For reference, Jeff's double hard flip is 29 frames and Jimmy's 540 flip is 33 frames. These are two very powerful tricks you could use when you're mostly flat land or even jumping down to gain speed. With the assistance of BS Grind, Nami was able to determine that Rune Glyphberg was the undisputed best skater. While he doesn't have the backflip nor a special grind, Rune has the kickflip McTwist, something that can easily replace a flip, and the most important trick of all, Christ Air. Christ Air takes 20 frames to come out. Okay, so why is this important? As mentioned earlier, THPS 1's speed is very dependent on the amount of points you score. If you do a few tricks, you might see a small speed boost after landing. So if you use a special trick, something that gives you even more points, like Christ Air, you will see a much larger speed boost, even more if you're able to hold the trick before you land. With this new revelation, Nami was ready. August 12th, they would finally get into the any percent top 3. Sporting a 453.333, Nami would make very few mistakes. Fortunately, they wouldn't have to wait long for another shot. Getting a 440.9 on the very next day, within a second of George and the world record. This time, losing time in streets. That's it. That's it. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. We barely did it. It's a 438. That's gotta be a 438. It has to be. Oh, okay. It's a robot. Not cool. So just like George's. Nami had completed the sweep. Within two years, and one of which was a very long hiatus, Nami would become the third person in the game's history to sweep the leaderboards and become the undisputed champion of THBS1. How did it feel to finally take down a legend? You know, I, in preparation for this, I went back and watched my 438, because I, I was trying to remember. I remember the 430 really vividly, but the 438 I couldn't remember that well. And going back and watch it, I'm not sure, because I think, I think it was a swirl of emotions, because on one hand, like, 
don't don't get me wrong it does feel good it did feel good but a lot of it was just relief some of it was also like how do i explain okay so the this this might jump ahead to one of the other questions i think a little bit but i auto kickoff came out right it was like auto kickoff is faster and i was already planning on beating the record before that happened that was just like it's gonna make it easier now and from then this isn't a perfect approximation but basically i saw it as auto kickoff was six free seconds one second off of each non-competition level like it's just straight up you use auto kickoff you are saving six seconds so when i only beat him by one second to me it felt like i didn't really beat him like i have to beat him by at least six seconds and then i'll feel good about it it still felt good but like it was like it felt like cheating in a way (laughs) um and so i was relieved to beat it but i knew that i had to take it further and i was still a little like apprehensive about taking it further so it did feel good but it was like it was by no means the end or anything so going into 2020 several things happened during the worldwide COVID 19 shutdown with some more free time one of the veteran players and tassers of the community fog would develop a new task for thps1 after researching and learning how to replicate the 0% speed run, he would create the run relatively quickly and submit it to task videos. Renaming it to the replay glitch, he was able to attain a 211.92 with task timing. While there was nothing new showcase, it was a neat opportunity to show the greater community that THPS1 is kinda broken in some ways. Returning to Nami's Crusade, they would not be able to get another shot at beating the record until April 11th, 2020. They would get a 430.5 and merely said one thing to any potential challengers. Good luck. The 430.5 in any percent was the ultimate culmination of thousands of hours of practice. The optimizations of a united sub-community who wanted to see this game pushed to its absolute limits. The capabilities brought onto it with auto kick and even the config glitch and just pure sheer will to overcome. While it was not perfect, it was pretty damn close to it. Satisfied with this time, they would also submit the time to Speed Demos Archive to replace Discombobulator's old run and eventually have it approved in April 2021. One of the key features of their new run was the inclusion of soft resets. Initially discovered by BS Grind a few months prior on January 7th, it was determined that soft resetting out of non-competition levels would carry over progression through the reset. After some discussion, Nami would eventually take BS Grind on the idea and began to do some testing. After going back and forth on the timing and determining the best possible spot to do it, they would determine that each soft reset would save roughly a second, but you had to press and hold the reset inputs for three and a half seconds for it to work. Soft resetting required pressing Z plus start together. The awkward button placements of a standard N64 controller meant you had to balance your movement, speed, not fail, and still reposition your hands to complete the soft reset properly. There aren't any good ways to do this, so each runner would usually develop their own trick or life hack to do it. And that is without me mentioning that doing a soft reset too early will end your run since you miss an objective, and going too late will not save you any time at all. Just to show the potential power of this trick, look at Nami's world record and their prior run. While the IGT was the same, they saved almost 8 seconds in real time, a decent amount of which with a new soft reset strategy, with some more or less coming from slightly better menuing. Oh fuck, I just looked at the clock. I shouldn't have. Later in the year, Nami would revisit 100% two more times. On June 14th, they would get a 626.867. No! (laughs) Then two months later, beat it one more time with a 604.533. I think I'm done with 100%. Quite as low as I wanted, but I'll take it. Once again, wishing luck to any incoming challengers to the throne. The game was pushed to its absolute limit, with no more obvious time saves being available. Sub-6 was on the horizon, 
but the grind was becoming more and more difficult. Nami was the undisputed best THPS1 player, settling with the 604. But they also began to wonder when, or if, someone would arrive to challenge their reign. Fortunately, that wait would not be long. Let's rewind a little bit to June of 2020. During this time, a runner known as Adeline would join the THPS1 party. Previously, she had a bunch of different categories throughout the series, some being more for fun or for the memes, and others to get a legitimate place in that specific game. On the one hand, you would see her attempting some of the more niche runs from the category extensions leaderboard, but on the other, you would see that she was pushing various categories in Underground 1 and Underground 2 as far as she could. No matter the game, she was a constant threat to any status quo. There are not many players that could immediately meet the learning curve THPS1 presented, but she quickly worked to showcase she could do just that. On June 2nd, Adeline got an extremely rough 12.24 in her first entry in the 100% category. The next day, she would get a 10.31 and a 9.59 the day after that. Throughout the rest of the year, Adeline would grind away at her 100% time, never truly satisfied with what she kept accomplishing. By the end of the year, Adeline joined an elite group of THPS1 speedrunners by being only the sixth player in history to get a sub-7 time. With her 6.57, she had cut her time in the category almost in half. In the meantime, she incorporated practically every difficult strategy there was in the game. From a slightly slower version of the warehouse route inspired by the tasks to utilizing the power of the easier downtown wall ride, the game was opening up to Adeline and rewarding her for her persistence. Fast forward to April 28th of 2021, and under a year since she began her journey, Adeline would take the third place spot in 100% with a 641. While her splits were comparing against her sum of best, she was still relatively close in each level, even getting a gold in downtown and streets. In one run, she would jump Remedy and George, and set herself up to be only two seconds away from overcoming Wished and taking the second spot. It wouldn't be until August 23rd when Adeline would have another shot, getting an impressive 631, overcoming Wished and closing the gap between her and Nami even further. This time, Adeline would begin to use the same soft reset strategy that Nami incorporated into their any percent record. While Adeline was continuing to push new grounds in 100%, Nami had decided that the old task by Nahawk needed to be updated. At this point, it had been nearly 10 years since Nahawk made his mark on the community. Thus, for a good part of early 2021, Nami would make an updated task. The updated task featured improvements in every level, with a decent amount being attributed to better movement, auto kickoff, and soft resetting. Starting with Warehouse, the biggest change is a straight jump towards the K, then doing some very precise jumps and hops to get the rest of the objectives. Next major change would be in Chicago. Instead of going to the right, Nami instead went left into the wall and got just enough points on both heats using a very quick Nolly plus Madonna into a mini wall jump with a heel flip afterwards. This trick specifically was attributed to a discovery by Gwisht where pressing upright and L together would give you a very quick turn. Nami would showcase the brand new secret tape jump found by BS Grind, a jump that had been nicknamed Holy Calamity. For the rest of the run, it would be a majority of the same things we had seen throughout this video, but more optimized and more refined. In the end, Nami finished their task with a 443.28, beating Nahawk's old task by 25 seconds RTA and 16 seconds IGT. If you're wondering why almost everyone runs on console, well, here you go. Oftentimes, emulators do not mimic games one for one in load times. Even if you were to fix the task timing to begin on skater selection like in an RTA run, the task would barely be faster than the any percent record just because of emulator load times. As you can imagine, emulators are not a great option when running this game. With its approval, Nami will return to the sidelines, waiting patiently for when Adeline would finally take their record.
shit, dude. What the fuck? Later in October, Adlin would move within striking distance of the 100% record with an insanely impressive 609. The only difference is being very, very minor mistakes, such as failing to perform an additional trick after completing a heat in Chicago. Adelin was so very close. After taking a break for a few months, Adelin would return in March 2022. With no major changes having occurred between her break and return, it was back to the old grind. With two quick runs of a 508 and a 450 and 80%, she would turn her sights one last time towards Nami and the world record. During this time, Adeline would perform lots of offline attempts. At most, she would stream attempts to her groups of friends in Discord if they wanted to watch since the pressures of performing in front of them was a lot less compared to Twitch. There were plenty of times where she was close, but would eventually come through on April 24th with a 605.4. For those keeping score, she was literally less than a second away. A few too many very minor mistakes preventing her from taking it. Then, on April 30th, I remember when I when I beat my PB and just got like a six flat. I remember being very disappointed. I felt like I just like completely dropped the ball, especially because I just thought of times in the run where like I lost like maybe a second or something like that. I don't, I don't know. I, I remember the two PBs that I got before sub six felt very mind taxing because I knew at like a six oh nine that I was very capable of just like getting a sub six immediately well not immediately i think that's probably why it, i got those like little piddly pvs because <laughs> i <laughs> thought it'd be like so much easier to get to it but uh that game is a cruel mistress it will make you work yeah no i, I, I which feels kind of silly i feel like now in hindsight i probably should have been really excited that i like took that record down after all these years but i remember it wasn't good enough for me at the time just because i wanted something else instead of record. I, I, I wasn't even really going for record, I feel like. Adeline and Nami moved on to other projects and priorities for a while, knowing full well what a sub-6 would require from both of them. They just needed some extra motivation. In July of 2022, the development of this very documentary was announced to be in development. From this, both players were motivated to return to the game and begin to chip away the rust and grind towards the final barrier. <laughs>
it was finally over. After practicing, grinding, and improving, Adeline would become the first sub-6 and THPS one 100%. So, how did it feel to beat it again and get sub-6? Huge relief. I was so elated, honestly. I wouldn't say it's probably the happiest I've ever been in my life, but it was probably the most excited I've been for something. Because it felt like something that I was working like ages for finally paid off in a way. Which is always, I guess, cool, you know, even if it is like a random thing like speedrunning. I remember also, too, kind of doubting myself a lot, thinking that like I probably was never going to be able to get it or something. But so to have that get off, like that weight get off my back was kind of nice. <laughs> but it felt a little bittersweet as well, because I felt like I probably wouldn't have played the game as much as I'd want to. Just because it didn't feel like there was really much to work for. I guess I I don't know like there's there's still a lot that can be done with that game but like I feel like the motivation to like lower the time is not as tense for me as it was when it was still kind of like in the 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 six minute barrier uh, range. So would you say you don't really have plans right now to return to it? I'd like to, but I I'd like to come back to it, but I feel like there's just a couple of things that I. Part of it is probably, you know, soft resetting is yeah. a nightmare. Yeah, it's a really big one. I'm, I feel like I'm really close to figuring it out, but I just, I do not want to come back to that game and have to balance a N64 controller in between my feet. So yeah, you kind of have to pretend you're like an F1 formula driver and have like a controller in between your feet, pushing the <laughs> pedals while you skate along. You're probably going to go after the sub six for 100% sometime. Yeah, I I was talking, so, someone asked me this on my stream, I think I was talking about it to Beautiful Day and a couple other people. I, I said I wasn't going to, but part of me knew that I was like, sometime I might want to go back and try it. And there, there, there are two things about Adeline's run that make me want to want to grind and beat it. One is... As, as happy as I am with the run, and I hope she is too, but she did not beat my IGT record in her sub-6. And part of that's just the way, the way soft resets go, you're generally going to have a lower IGT. You kind of sacrifice that to, to get a better overall run. But at the same time, I'm like, okay, so I can still be faster than that, right? And then the other reason is she messes up uh, I, I don't know if she messed up or if she just planned for this, but she doesn't get the fastest second heat in Roswell. She gets the basically the same run that she did in her 604 or her her flat six her flat six run. Even though I've messed it up a lot, just like any any part of the game, I think Roswell is relatively easy compared to a lot of the other things. She loses like. Uh, less than five seconds, but like a couple seconds there. That when I rewatch the run and I'm like, ah, oh, and and it's a lower lower IGT than mine, or a slower IGT than mine. I was like, this can be better. It's really good. It's great. It's a fucking great run. But I think it can be better. Ever since Adeline's incredible run, THPS1 had entered one of its longest periods of downtime in recent memory. With a nearly perfect 80% run by Nami, and an incredible 100% run by Adeline, it is no wonder why no one has dared to challenge the status quo. New runners appear and get great runs, but the bar to become a record holder in the first pro skater game is arguably one of the highest in the franchise. The more recent upheaval came from the discovery of a new trick that would break apart the IL leaderboards, the end run trick. It was discovered that upon hitting end run, it won't take effect until you hit the ground and it stops the IL timer, which means, well. Oh, holy shit. So was that it? 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 Was that fucking it? Was that it? Was that it? Was that? Was that? Was that it? 
Outside of that, the most recent record activity would come from Beautiful Day and Peaceful Yarl 379 in the 0% category. On June 16th, 2023, Yarl would get a 150 RTA with Beautiful Day edging out the RTA record with a 144 on the very next day. Also in 2023, the THBS speedrun community held its inaugural league competition that featured a new game each month, with THPS1 kicking things off. While the race wasn't able to be recorded, Yar was able to show me his local recording from the race of him hitting this insane tape jump in streets. As of the making of this video, the records do not feature this trick, but they may in due time. Backtracking a little, Adeline would be the first to complete an IL of streets with this trick on April 10th, 2022, and got a 1 minute 6 second in-game time. The next day, she would go back and beat it with a 1 minute 5 second in-game time, featuring some very minor improvements. Nami would then take it for themselves on July 6th, after dozens of attempts and the creation of an iconic bail compilation video. This version of the trick involves performing a lip trick on the quarter pipe directly in front of the tape performing a very quick Christ air when you hit the ground to gain a larger speed boost, then performing a near perfect fast plant up to the tape. Do it right and you get the tape in style and it saves a ton of time. This trick is obviously RTA viable since it has been done, but is anyone really crazy enough to get a good run to streets then do this? Only time will tell. Fast forward to the beginning of 2024 and Nami would complete one more task for their collection, this time in 100%. They would be able to get a 552.53, again just barely being faster RTA because emulator load times aren't great, and would feature practically every trick discussed in this video. But Nami had one more trick up their sleeve. Nami also noted that they plan on remaking the any percent task soon, potentially with a theoretical route of four tapes in school, three in downtown, and four in streets. Will it be faster? Maybe. Either way, keep an eye out for that one. If anyone can make it work, it's Nami. For well over a decade, some of the community's greatest players attempted to tackle this game. Very few would survive its brutal difficulty. To those who aren't playing the game, this game is rough around the edges, is hard to get a grasp of, and is archaic compared to the later games. But if you pay attention, there is beauty within it. For those willing to survive its difficulty, understand what it asks of you, and master its mechanics, you will be gifted an experience and challenge unlike any other. There are few games like THPS 1, where you can feel yourself getting better and better every single day. And if you hit a wall, maybe you're looking at things the wrong way, or you're missing something, or you simply haven't asked the right questions to its veterans. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 is the definition of a speed game, and it is where it all began for our community. When or if more videos of this type are made, you will hear of these players again and again. You will hear how they formed new rivalries. You will hear how they made the meta of each game evolve just by them playing it. A lot of these runners set the foundation of what a Tony Hawk speedrun should be. The rest of us merely took what they gave us and continue to push into the future to this very day. None of our games may ever become one of the most well-known or most played games in the larger speedrunning scene. After almost 10 years, I see that we don't ever need to be. Sure, one can wish that more people play their games, take their games seriously, or that they see that there is more to a game than just its levels or its music. But, honestly, we don't need to impress anyone. You've seen firsthand what Tony Hawk players can do. This is the first of many stories within the Tony Hawk scene. And, maybe, one day, there may be more to tell. From Pro Skater 2 to Project 8, each game has a rich story, many world records between numerous players, and a shared will to push the games further than originally thought possible. Hell, even Proving Ground, as of the making of this video, is finally seeing some progress. Even if there are no more of these videos made, even if this is your first glimpse into our little speedrunning scene, 
or even if this is your first introduction to speedrunning in general, I very much appreciate you watching. 2024 is the 25th anniversary of this franchise. I have never been more excited for what the future holds for us. After making this documentary, I am left with one last thought. We aren't done yet. And, in fact, we are just getting started.